Hi everyone, my name is Angelina and I'm the host of The Daily Watch. Welcome back to another episode of True Crime Stories in Southeast Asia. Today we're going to talk about Charles Sobraj, the serpent, also known as the Bikini Killer. For those of you who may be hearing about him for the first time, this is Charles Sobraj. So he became notorious in the period of the 1970s, and by 1976, he was Interpol's most wanted man and had arrest warrants in three different continents. He traveled and carried out a spree of crimes and murder on the Southeast Asia hippie trail. Think about this as sort of the backpacker trail today. He was believed to have killed between 12 to 24, targeting mostly Western backpackers. Charles Sabraj is known by a variety of names, most famously the Bikini Killer, which has to do with the attire of the victims he murdered. He is also known as the Splitting Killer and the Serpent due to his skills and deception. I think what makes him an interesting topic is because he's this charismatic character. He was well-traveled, he was all over France and Southeast Asia at some point, even as he was trying to evade arrest. He's fluent in multiple languages. He was described as being devilishly handsome with a cunning and cultured personality, and he used his attractiveness to his advantage in his criminal career. He also became a media obsession back then. He led a luxurious life, even while in jail, using his amassed wealth to bribe prison officials. It was said he will have conjugal visits from fans and weekend parties allowed by the prison staffers. There's actually several books written about him. BBC made an eight-part TV drama on him in a co-production with Netflix entitled The Serpent, set to premiere on New Year. So if you're interested to know more about his story, it's something to watch out for. His ties to Southeast Asia is not just about the fact that this is where he committed a lot of his crimes. Sabraj is actually half Vietnamese and half Indian. He was born in Saigon in 1944 to an Indian moneylender and his illiterate Vietnamese mistress. His childhood wasn't a happy one. When he was four, his father abandoned him and his mother remarried a French army officer who would adopt him. So while Sabraj was Vietnamese Indian by birth, he was a French national by adoption. He faced constant rejection in his childhood. His birth father never accepted him, and he disliked his stepfather. He started with petty crimes. He was first jailed at 19 for burglary in France, and during his time in jail, he gained a reputation for being a conniving manipulator who curried favor with his jailers. He got paroled, and he started to build his wealth and notorious image in the French underworld for burglaries and scams. So from then on until his eventual arrest in 1976, Sabraj was a man on the run, committing increasingly bolder and more violent crimes, using as many as 10 stolen passports to evade authorities. His crimes took a darker turn in Thailand, where he charms a young Canadian woman named Marie Andre Leclerc, who will later become his girlfriend and accomplice. He also recruited a young Indian man, Anjay Chaudhary, who became his second in command. It was rumored that he wanted to create a family for himself, a cult like Charles Manson's. He gathered followers by gaining their loyalty, typically helping them out of scams he himself orchestrated. So the first known victim was Teresa Knowlton, a young woman from Seattle who had traveled to Bangkok. She met Sabraj, who allegedly offered to be her guide and to take her to Pattaya Beach, where her body was later found burned. The next victim was Vitali Hakim, whose burnt body was found on the road to the Pattaya Resort where Sabraj and his growing clan were staying. Dutch students Hank Bintanja and his fiance Cornelia Hamker were invited to Thailand after meeting Sabraj in Hong Kong, and they, like many others, were poisoned by Sabraj, who then nurtured them back to health in order to gain their obedience. Later, their bodies were found strangled and burned. By this time, he got a visit from his previous victim's girlfriend named Charmaine Carew, who was investigating her boyfriend's disappearance. Soon after, Carew was found drowned and wearing a similar styled swimsuit to that of Sabraj's first victim, Teresa Knowlton. So at first, police investigators did not connect the two cases, but when they did, that's when Sabraj became known as, guess what, the bikini killer. 
From there on, he will use his victim's passports to travel all over from Thailand to India to Singapore and to Malaysia, trying to evade the authorities because at some point, some of his clan members started to suspect him of serial murder, having found documents belonging to the murder victims. They will report him in Chowdhury to the authorities. Reportedly, the clan was interrogated by Thai policemen in connection with the murders, but released because authorities feared that the negative publicity accompanying a murder trial would harm the country's tourist industry. So even Shalhari himself will later disappear after a gem heist in Malaysia, which was the last time he will ever be seen. Until now, his body has never been found. So if we put two and two together, it's highly likely that Sabraj murdered him too. So bodies and victims are piling up. His last crime actually was in Delhi. Um, it has been grandiose but uncharacteristically sloppy. Intending to steal the money and passports of 60 young French tourists, he drugged the entire party. But Sabraj confused his doses and the people just really got a very, very bad case of diarrhea. And the management of the hotel where they were staying summoned the police and that's when Sabraj was arrested. But the life of this cunning psychopath does not end here. Sabraj was jailed in the most famous Indian jail, the Tihar jail. He was sentenced to 11 years imprisonment for passport forgery, theft, and the drugging of the young tourist. Why did he not get the death penalty or harsher sentence, you may ask? Although there are corpses strewn around several Asian countries, it is only in Thailand that enough evidence has been gathered to bring him to trial for murder. According to Thai law, if a suspect is not caught and brought to trial within 20 years of the offense, the charges are automatically dropped. And the thing is, India refuses to extradite any convict until he has served his punishment there. So Sabraj, being the cunning criminal he is, plans to exploit this loophole. We'll get back to this later. So apparently he had entered the jail with precious gems concealed in his body and used this to bribe prison officials. His luxurious lifestyle reportedly includes television and gourmet food. He gave interviews to Western authors and journalists. He will continue to use his charm not just for his lady fans, but also on the prison officials. He was reported to have sexual relations with his lawyer, Sneha Sandra, and prisoners and wardens actually respect him. He gives money from his mysterious overseas bank accounts to help the children of the poor prisoners and of the underpaid guards. So let's go back to the statute of limitations in Thailand. By 1985, his jail term in India was nearly finished, knowing that the Thai authorities were awaiting him as soon as he was released from Indian custody. He orchestrated an escape, which apparently he's very good at having escaped other prisons in India, Afghanistan and Greece in the past. So he was successful, but he was quickly caught in Goa and had his prison term prolonged by 10 years, which is exactly as he had hoped. And so in 1997, the then 52-year-old Sabraj was released, with most warrants, evidence, and even witnesses against him long lost. Without any country to deport him to, Indian authorities let him return to France. By this time, Sabraj was such a huge media sensation that he was offered deals for books and films. He then lived in the suburbs of Paris, enjoying a comfortable retirement. He hired an agent and charged thousands of dollars for interviews and photographs and upwards of $15 million for a movie deal based on his life. His life of crime, however, caught up with him several years later when he was arrested in a Kathmandu, Nepal casino in 2003 for allegedly traveling on a false passport and for murders of a Canadian man and an American woman, which he allegedly carried out 20 years ago. So where is he now? He's still alive and spending a life sentence in a Nepalese prison. In 2008, while in prison, still ensnaring people with his charm, he became engaged to a Nepalese woman 44 years his junior. Unlike most violent offenders, Charles Sabraj did not seem to commit his murders out of uncontrollable, deep-seated, violent impulses, which many serial killers experience. It was more perceived as a byproduct of his lifestyle, yet he's still widely believed to be a psychopath. He doesn't call what he does murder, he calls it cleaning. And by his own confession, he has cleaned many times. Money was not even a motive for these cleanings. His victims were backpackers and small-time drug smugglers. It appears that Sobraj had begun to think of himself as a criminal 
Superman, who is above everyone else's moral code. He said once after he was captured that he can justify the murders himself and that he never killed good people. He said, if some will ask me whether I feel remorse, and many will, I answer. Does a professional soldier feel remorse after having killed a hundred men with a machine gun? Did the American pilots feel remorse after dropping napalm on my homeland? No. So that's it for today. If you liked today's video or learned anything new, press the like button. Subscribe and ring the bell to get the latest content from the Daily Watch. See you next time.